Welcome to ID the Future, a podcast about intelligent design and evolution. Hello, I'm Andrew McDermott. Discovery Institute has a new book out, the title Evolution and Intelligent Design in a Nutshell. You can find it online at Barnes & Noble and Amazon. It's a quick guide to everything from fine-tuning and the Big Bang to the origin of life, the Cambrian explosion, stunning biological machines like the bacterial flagellum, and irreducibly complex systems such as we find in the human body. Five authors came together to write the book, and today we're pleased to bring you an excerpt from Chapter 3, written by Eric H. Anderson. Here, Anderson focuses on one aspect of the origin of life problem, getting the first self-reproducing biological entity. Once you have that, evolutionists theorize, then the Darwinian process of random mutations and natural selection can kick in and generate all the diversity of life we find around us. That Darwinian claim is another argument for another day. But first we have to ask, how do you get that first self-reproducing cell or molecule? Many evolutionists say it happened through the blind forces of nature. In Chapter 2, Anderson summarizes one key problem with that idea, the information problem. Blind forces don't write line after line of exquisite software code. That is, they don't write the genetic and epigenetic software essential for even the simplest one-celled organisms. That's Chapter 2. In Chapter 3, Anderson focuses on an engineering problem. What does it take to build a self-reproducing machine? The answer? A great deal, and perhaps more than you even imagined. We turn now to the reading, the first few pages of Chapter 3, read by the author himself, Eric Anderson. Evolution and Intelligent Design in a Nutshell Chapter 3 A Factory That Builds Factories That Build Factories That By Eric H. Anderson Read by the author Nobel Prize recipient and Harvard Origin of Life researcher Jack Shostak once remarked, In my lab we're interested in the transition from chemistry to early biology on the early Earth. You want something that can grow and divide and, most importantly, exhibit Darwinian evolution. Another noted Origin of Life researcher, Gerald F. Joyce, says much the same thing. When asked about the idea that chemicals might have come together on the early Earth to form something that could copy itself, Joyce responded, that's what we and others are interested in because that's sort of, you know, the tipping point between chemistry before and biology after. Self-replication, then, is not just one more in a long list of problems to be solved for the origin of life. As far as many of the leading origin of life researchers are concerned, discovering the pathway to a self-replicating entity is the central challenge, the holy grail. Figure out how to get that from purely natural processes, and the hope is that everything else will take care of itself. But it's a grail that continues to elude the research community, despite the brash claims occasionally made to the contrary. Dawkins's Miracle Molecule A few years ago I happened to turn on my car radio and caught the end of a lecture segment on public radio. Evolutionary biologist and prominent atheist Richard Dawkins was the guest. Dawkins held the position of Professor for the Public Understanding of Science at Oxford University for more than a decade, and one of the questions posed to him made me quickly reach over and turn up the volume. How close are we to understanding the origin of life, the moderator asked. I half expected Dawkins to acknowledge the many difficulties with abiogenesis, to admit that this was a huge open question, and to confess that we don't yet have any good abiogenesis scenarios, while claiming, as so many proponents of evolution do, that the origin of life is a separate question from biological evolution. That is, I thought he might concede the many widely acknowledged difficulties still facing the origin of life, but try to contain the damage for the materialist outlook by emphasizing that at least things were well in hand for evolutionary theory after the origin of the first life. To my surprise, Dawkins responded rather glibly that we have a pretty good idea how life started. Yes, there are some challenges, he acknowledged, but we know what happened in broad strokes, and at this point, he implied, we are basically filling in the details. Having studied the origin of life at length and being aware of the many and acute problems with abiogenesis theories, it struck me as more than a little irresponsible for someone wearing the title of Professor for the Public Understanding of Science to claim in a public venue to tens of thousands of listeners that we have a pretty good idea how life started. Why would Dawkins make a statement like that? Was he purposely misinforming listeners about the current state of the science, or was he unaware of the many problems with abiogenesis? 
Did he really believe what he was saying? As I analyzed the question further in the coming days, I realized that Dawkins' thinking likely stems from the notion that the origin of life, at least the initial starting event, was a relatively simple event. Not necessarily a common event, or an easily repeatable event, mind you, but a relatively simple one. In his book The Selfish Gene, Dawkins paints a picture remarkably similar to Darwin's statement in his 1871 letter to Joseph Hooker, quoted in the previous chapter. Nowadays, large organic molecules would not last long enough to be noticed. They would be quickly absorbed and broken down by bacteria or other living creatures, Dawkins writes. But bacteria and the rest of us are latecomers. And in those days on the early earth, large organic molecules could drift unmolested through the thickening broth. With this assumed backdrop of early earth conditions, Dawkins goes on to suggest the first key step in the origin of life. At some point, a particularly remarkable molecule was formed by accident. We will call it the replicator. It may not necessarily have been the biggest or the most complex molecule around, but it had the extraordinary property of being able to create copies of itself. This hypothetical self-replicating molecule is crucial to the materialist creation story, and on two counts. First, getting a complete organism to arise by chance is, as is widely acknowledged, too unlikely and never could have occurred. So something simpler, something that had a much greater likelihood of arising by pure chance, something like a self-replicating molecule had to kickstart the process. Second, once this self-replicating molecule came on the scene, then Darwinian evolution could kick in, bringing the impressive power of random mutations and natural selection to eventually transform our simple self-replicating molecule into an actual organism. At least that is how the story goes. This particularly remarkable molecule, Dawkins suggests, is easy to imagine. And the remainder of his description of this extraordinary entity consists of a simple, though chemically unrealistic, thought experiment about how such a fascinating molecule might work, making copies of itself, competing with other molecules in the watery environment, and so on. Origin of life researchers, to their credit, haven't been satisfied with thought experiments alone. There has been a great deal of effort expended over the past couple of decades trying to create a self-replicating molecule in the lab and then to apply the lessons learned to the question of the origin of life. Some good work has been done, and some interesting results occasionally published, but nobody has been able to create such a molecule. To be sure, there have been several papers published and news stories released proclaiming that researchers have created this or that self-replicating molecule, but these claims invariably turn out to be misleading. If anyone has actually discovered or created a self-replicating molecule, they are keeping it a very good secret. This failure to produce such a molecule, keep in mind, is despite decades of research and lavish financial expenditure. The reason for the failure is not for lack of time, effort, and funding. No, the reason is much more fundamental. The blob has a secret. As we saw in the previous chapter, there was a sense in Darwin's day that microorganisms were rather simple, each one little more than a tiny blob of protoplasm. Darwin viewed the organism as a flexible conglomeration of these simple cells. Through no fault of their own, he and his contemporaries of the time knew nothing of genetic information processing, signaling and feedbacks, nothing of cellular machinery, integrated systems, complex coordination of molecular parts, or the many other requirements for even the simplest working cell. In The Origin of Species, Darwin described organisms as plastic. He wasn't referring to the material used to make children's toys today, but rather to the idea that organisms were flexible and could, he was convinced be readily shaped and molded by natural selection to essentially any form. From this viewpoint, it followed that adding more cells or making changes to the organism should also be a relatively simple process. However, with the accumulating knowledge of cellular structures in the late 1800s, the discoveries of cellular systems and proteins and metabolic pathways, the unraveling of DNA's structure in the 1950s, and the subsequent discoveries up to the present that continue to uncover new depths of biological complexity, it became ever clearer that cells are anything but simple, and that even the humblest organism is complex beyond anything previously imagined. Not just complex, complex and coordinated, with a 4-bit digital code, information storage, retrieval and translation mechanisms, error correction algorithms, functionally integrated systems, and molecular machines. Marvels of nanotechnology that put to shame anything humans have yet created. As a result of these discoveries, it became increasingly clear that no organism, even a relatively simple single-celled organism, could arise all at once on the early Earth by chance. But if life couldn't arise by chance as a single event, 
Perhaps a series of events could do the trick. Perhaps if the problem were broken down into simpler steps, then it might be possible. With that thought firmly in mind, abiogenesis proponents busily churned out hypothesis after hypothesis that might help the process along. Simpler steps that could perhaps lead to something more. That was author Eric H. Anderson, reading from Chapter 3 of his co-authored new book, Evolution and Intelligent Design in a Nutshell. Where he goes from there is quite fascinating. He draws upon his background as a software engineering executive to look at some exciting efforts to build the first self-reproducing 3D printers. Engineers are light years from achieving such a goal, but they have taken the first baby steps in that direction, and the breakthroughs they've made as well as the challenges that lie ahead, allow us to better understand the myriad of engineering feats required of any self-reproducing machine. Anderson then shows how these insights further deepen the origin of life problem for all those who are wedded to explaining the origin of life in purely unguided materialistic terms. It's great stuff. Grab the book at Barnes & Noble or Amazon and see for yourself. The book, incidentally, would also make an excellent graduation gift. We need a vaccine for deadly viruses such as the coronavirus. We also need to inoculate our young people against the misleading evolutionary propaganda posing as objective science in some of their high school and college science classes. For that, evolution and intelligent design in a nutshell is excellent medicine. Pick up a copy for yourself and a second copy for a gift. The book is concise, lively, and very readable. For ID the Future, this is Andrew McDermott. Cheers.